So full disclosure, uh, when I attempted to record this lecture actually in class, I was horrifically sick. It was probably the worst cold that I've had in a long time. So I was uh, trying to, I, I knew that the audio wouldn't sound good. So I decided to, especially now that I've got time, it might have been a coronavirus that I had. Who knows? But now that I've got the time, um, I want to record this anyhow. And of course, put it up on the YouTubes. Um, so I just wanted to have that full disclosure. Uh, so that being said, um, you know, this oftentimes the big <gasps> moments happen with an audience, but the only audience I've got are my cats and my dog, and they don't care much about things. So we were talking about war crimes and what constitutes a war crime. We went over the examples of Kachin and uh, the rape of Nanking, and we've got another one, the Bataan Death March. This was another one that the Japanese committed. Uh, on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese launched a sneak attack against the United States Naval Base in Pearl Harbor. And um, it was a sneak attack for the reasons that we talked about with the, the rape of Nanking, that the United States was about to cut off their oil if Japan did not abandon their, um, their empire. And so as a result, you know, they, they didn't want to let go of the empire, so they decided to strike out. Their ultimate goal was to get, uh, get access to oil, oil fields in Indonesia. And, um, but the United States would not sit idly by with that while that happened. Hence why the Japanese attacked the Pacific fleet. The other reason that they attacked was because they figured that the United States was a paper tiger that if they hit the United States hard enough right in the face, that the United States would crumble. <laughs> Joke's on that. But on paper, it was a very good plan. But naturally, you know, as you guys probably learned with your game of diplomacy, if you're going to stab someone in the back, you better be ready to twist the knife. It doesn't help if you only hit, hit someone in the one spot. And so while the next day after Pearl Harbor, I guess it depends on the date line. But either way, very soon after Pearl Harbor was hit, the Japanese started a campaign pushing into Vietnam, pushing southwards, chugging towards Indonesia. They attacked the Philippines, which was part of the United States territory. So this event, with all that background, this event specifically happens in April of 1942. Uh, U.S. soldiers were completely cut off from the outside world. And they're being attacked by an overwhelming Japanese force. And they fight for a good month and a half straight. And they lose a lot of guys, a lot of people get wounded. But at a given point, they can't continue. They figure 75,000 POWs is better than 75,000 corpses. So the Americans and the Filipinos, they're surrendering. But of course, if we remember back to Bushido Code and the Japanese sense of honor, uh, they, do not, they do not find prisoners to be very um, honorable. They treat prisoners as less than human. So once these prisoners are taken captured, once they're taken captive, uh, they are treated horrifically. They're forced to march 60 miles to a prison camp. And 60 miles, that's roughly between here and, you know, one of those little towns between here and Payson, like Strawberry or Pine. And this is dense, dense jungle that we are talking about. Um, flies and mosquitoes and poisonous lizards and, and, plants and underbrush and wild pigs and just horrific conditions. Very high humidity, very high temperatures. And while they're watch, walking and mar marching, they're having malnutrition, dehydration, there are beatings left, right, and center. There are summary executions. 
people are just being shot or stabbed by the Japanese guards. And of course, we have to remember that they are not in peak physical condition. They had just spent the last month and a half in a harrowing fight for their lives. And a lot of them are wounded. And sometimes the Japanese will just tell people to just leave that wounded guy behind, or they would just bayonet the wounded guys. So it's absolutely horrific conditions that they are dealing with. We started with 75,000 prisoners. By the time the march was over, 21,600 POWs died. We can see here, down here, that this man is about to be executed with a katana. Up here, we can see how thin they are. Let's try this again. Absolutely starved. We can see here the columns that they were forced to march in. If anyone stepped out from these columns, they were liable to be shot or bayoneted or beaten. So absolutely horrific conditions. Very clearly, this is a war crime. It is a violation of the Geneva Convention. These prisoners are not being treated well. Of course, the end result of this, um, the United States didn't know about this. No one knew that this was happening until years later, until the Philippines were taken back by the Americans later in the war. And once they took back the Philippines, they start hearing these horrific stories about how the Japanese treated people, treated POWs. And we should also note that this is not unique. This is not a unique moment. The Japanese had a very uh, long-standing, uh, they consistently treated prisoners of war very poorly. That's what I mean to be trying to say. Once these stories start filtering out, Americans, British are extremely angry. And this very much factors into anti-Japanese propaganda that was promoted by the governments of the Allied powers. And in many ways, it helped to contribute to this sense of just utter brutality that the Pacific had. That was a brutality that you didn't quite see on the American side when they were fighting the Germans. We're talking about you know, refusing to take prisoners of war which in itself is a war crime. Part of the reason for that was sometimes the Japanese would pretend to surrender and then trick people afterwards. Or they would pretend to be a dead body and then ambush. So because of those factors and because the Japanese often for refused to give up, we see a, just an utter brutality. An American experience of utter brutality that was not consonant with the rest of the war. We saw a very similar level of brutality between the Germans and the Russians, but we didn't see that same level between the Germans and the Americans or the, the British and the Germans. Our next example, and this is, this is where we start to get a little iffy about whether or not these things are war crimes. We start to see that maybe it's arguable. The, la the first three that we did, or the first four that we did, were obvious, easy peasy. This is where we start getting into some ethical dilemmas. The firebombing of Dresden. So for a little bit of context, um, Dresden is a town in eastern Germany, right on that border. And it also happens to be right in the path of this Soviet red wave, this tsunami of the Red Army just pushing forward, and destroying everything in their path. One thing that we have to remember is that the Soviets lost 20 million people fighting against the Germans. And they are not in a forgiving mood. Once the Red Army starts pushing into Germany itself, we start to see incidents of entire towns being burned down by the Red Army. Fields of wheat being pillaged and then salt being put into the ground. By the time the war is over, the Russians raped two million German women as a form of revenge. So naturally, if you're a German civilian 
uh, I would imagine you don't want to be caught by the Russians. It's better to be caught by the Americans or the British. It's better to be on that side. So because of this Russian red wave, there are tens of thousands of refugees fleeing through Dresden. The specific incident happens the night of February 13th through the 15th, primarily the night of Valentine's Day, the 14th. Talk about a hot date. Um, during this night, the United States Air Force and the Royal Air Force, so the Americans and the British, dropped 3,900 tons of explosives in two days. 3,900 tons. That's 7.8 million pounds of TNT. 40% of them are incendiary, which means that they are designed to set things on fire. But of course, what's important to remember is they're not just dropping the bombs willy-nilly. They are targeting the factories in the town and other strategic assets. You know, the factories there are making bullets and mortars and artillery shells and guns for the German army. So the question is, you know, if, if the Germans don't have ammo, can they keep shooting? And the obvious answer is no. So this is part of that campaign of a campaign of what was called strategic bombing or saturation bombing. The Americans always flew it during the day because the theory was that would provide more accuracy. The RAF almost always flew at night because they didn't care. They had lived through the blitz and so they were always aiming for the factories, but we have to remember the technology at the time. So even though they were aiming for the factories, not all the bombs hit their targets. Some of the bombs went miles off target. All this bombing, and we have to remember, they're dropping all of this stuff on a town. And it causes something called a firestorm, where there are all these fires that are all through the town. They're burning away and they start to grow. And at a given point, the fire department can't take care of them all, can't put them all out. So the fires grow out of control. They start merging together. They start building and building. They start generating their own wind. They become so hot and so large. This is what it looked like from the sky. Imagine a forest fire, but inside of town. And some of these firestorms got so bad, you know, fire is a very greedy thing. It likes to suck up all the oxygen in areas. So people are hiding in their bomb shelters and it's becoming harder and harder to breathe because the fires are so big that they are sucking the oxygen out of the places. By the end of the night, 25,000 people were killed, burned to death. And that's just an estimate. We're not entirely sure of exactly how many people died. Some people were completely reduced to ash. You can't count a body if there is no body. And the end result of all of this is that the United States justified it. Technically, under the Geneva Convention, this is not a war crime. They were targeting the factories, and it just so happened that 25,000 people were in the way. It was an accident. In military parlance, they call that collateral damage. You know, of course, Dresden was not the only place where this happened to. Uh, the bombing of Hamburg in 1943 caused the deaths of about 40,000 people. That was actually called Operation Gomorrah, which, if you know your Bible, is a direct reference to when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire. So technically, this is not a war crime but I'll leave it up to you to decide for yourself. But just with the knowledge that they're aiming for the factories, 
Further, just to reinforce this point that this was not the only town that this happened to, let's take a look at another short list of towns in Germany that were bombed. Now, if you remember from our discussions of the Jacobson family, of Aylett Jacobson, my great-grandfather, this was his flight record. Merseburg, Brandenburg, Ruland, Frankfurt, Kolm, Kassel, Mannheim, Hanover, Munster, Merseburg, Frankfurt, Berlin. All of these are towns where they dropped firebombs. So the question is, you know, if you if you think Dresden is a war crime, does that mean then that you think my great grandfather is a war criminal? I know it's not a fair question to ask, but it's something to consider. I've got another tough question to consider, but we have to get to our next example first. This is the firebombing of Tokyo. Second verse, very similar to the first. This was Operation Meeting House, which took place the March 9th through the 10th, 1945. The United States Air Force dropped 1,665 tons of explosives over the city of Tokyo about three and a half million pounds of TNT, about half as much as they dropped on Dresden. Um, but there were compounding factors. For one thing, a lot of Japanese architecture, especially traditional Japanese architecture, was reliant on wood and paper. So a lot of the buildings are made out of those materials. And for another thing, there were not any air raid shelters in Tokyo. The Japanese government had planned on building them, but never quite got around to it. So they told everyone, go in your backyard and dig a hole. The other compounding factor is that the factories that the Air Force was aiming for were all mixed up with residential areas. The theory for the Japanese being that they didn't want their workers to have to walk as far to get to work. So the targets are all mixed up with the houses. Further, Tokyo at this time was one of the most densely populated places in the world, about 100,000 people per square mile. So again, we're dropping all these bombs on a city. A lot of them are incendiary. This also creates a firestorm that destroys 15.8 square miles of the city. 100,000 people per square mile, we're looking at about one and a half million people affected in some way. In one night, 100,000 people burned to death, at least. It's the bloodiest single bombing raid in human history, and knock on wood, hopefully it will remain the bloodiest single bombing raid in human history. To put this in perspective, only about 80,000 or so people died in Hiroshima. Only about 90,000 died in Nagasaki. So this one bombing raid was deadlier than one of those taken individually. But of course, the United States wasn't aiming for the people, they were aiming for the factories. 100,000 people just happened to be in the way. Um, the man who was in charge of all of this, who was primarily his idea, was a man named General Curtis LeMay, and he had this to say about the topic. I suppose if I had lost the war, I would have been tried as a war criminal. Every soldier thinks something of the moral aspects of what he is doing, but all war is immoral, and if you let that bother you, you're not a good soldier. Now that's his opinion, and you may disagree with it if you wish, but it is an interesting ethical dilemma, isn't it? 
This is what it looked like after Tokyo was bombed. It almost looks like the aftermath of an atom bomb. But that leads you know, to the next hard question. Every day that the war continues, every single day, people are dying. In Kursk, Moscow, Leningrad, Stalingrad, Monte Cassino, on the beaches of Normandy, Bastogne. Every day the war continues, people are dying. One of my classes, we figured it out that it was on average about 27,000 people every single day. So the question is, if you could shorten the war by one day, would you do it? But then the next question is, well, how? How would you shorten it? By burning 20,000 people. What we do know is that even with the bombing, it took six years to end the war. How much longer would the war have gone on if we had not engaged in this kind of bombing? It's one of those counterfactuals, one of those what ifs that make that keep me up at night in particular, thinking about what could have been, what should have been. I'm not gonna tell you an answer, it's up to you to decide, but it is a very serious question to consider. Would you do a terrible thing to try to stop a horrific thing? And with that, we are finished. Very glad it didn't take that long. Now hopefully, this recording will be fine.